Welcome to this video where we'll start our review of the reproductive systems. And we will start that by looking at it in males. In the next module, we will shift our attention to the female system. And what you will notice, I think, is that the male system is much more simple than that of a female. And this is true, especially when it comes to the hormonal changes and regulation, where we have quite a lot to look at in females. For example, the menstrual cycle. So this section is going to be a little more brief in nature, but we will make it work as always. And the reason why understanding this chapter's content is so important comes back to what we have discussed earlier. First, we must understand the anatomy and physiology of a normal system before we can start to assess diseases and other pathologies. For example, STIs and issues with a couple having trouble with conceiving a child. And of course, as always, the role of educating your patients on how to stay healthy is going to be important too. So let's get started. There is going to be some essential terminology that we will have to know for this and the coming lecture on male and female reproductive systems, as well as when we consider gestation and life cycle. And the first one that we are going to have a look is going to be gonads. So these are our primary sex organs. So for males, testes, and for females, ovaries. And note here that all other reproductive organs and structures that we will see in these chapters are going to be accessory structures. So only testes and ovaries are going to be primary sex organs. And I think that we should have a look of the functions of primary sex organs, so gonads, in a little more detail. And there are two that we need to know. So the first one is usually quite an obvious one for the most. Gonads produce sex cells. So sex cells are known as gametes. In addition, gonads produce quite importantly sex hormones. So it's not just the production of the sex cells why we need these, but the sex hormone production is just as an important factor to consider. Of course, we know that sex cells produced by the testes in male are sperm, and you can sometimes see a term spermatozoa being used instead of a sperm. And in female, by the ovaries, the egg cells. We commonly prefer to use in medical language terms ova or oocyte for the egg cell. And for the sex hormones, we have, of course, androgens. And for the female, estrogen and progesterone. So with these key terms in mind, we should be comfortable with tackling in this module the male reproductive system's anatomy and physiology. So why don't we do just that? So when we cover anatomy, and along the anatomy, the physiology of the male reproductive system, you will often see a diagram like this. So here we see a mid-sagittal section of the male pelvis with certain structures that we already know. It is always a good idea to start with structures that you are already familiar with from the past. So why don't we do what we know here from the structures that we have already covered in this course. Well, we can see urinary bladder, which is this large prominent sac-like structure here in the middle. And we see, of course, ureter bringing urine into it from the kidneys. And as a side note, you may remember ureters enter the urinary bladder at the base. So 
I would personally move the entry point a little lower here on the posterior side though, so that's correct. Remember the trigon formed by the ureters and ureters opening at the basis of the bladder. And as you already worked out, I'm sure, we have the urethra coming out from the urinary bladder. Taking the urine to the external world out from the body via opening at the end of the pin. We might also be able to recognize some other anatomical landmarks like rectum posteriorly and anal opening where it empties to the external world out from the body. And of course we see our old friend peritoneum lining here above the bladder as continuous membrane that continues upwards both on the anterior and posterior part of the abdominal pelvic cavity and then abdominal cavity. And let's not forget our pubic bone here. It is a great landmark on the anterior aspect of the pelvis. I have also added urogenital diaphragm foreskin and opening of the urethra just to get those structures ticked off from our list on this diagram. And that leaves us with all these other structures which are part of the male reproductive system. We are going to go through them step by step. But we are going to use the diagram that we see here. It simply is a simplified drawing of what we just so, so the key structures of the male reproductive system. And we are going to start with the testes. Remember, these were the primary sex organ of the male. So male gonads. All other parts that we will look at, those are going to be simply accessory organs or structures. And we also should remember the two main functions of the testes. So they produce male gametes, which were of course sperm. And the second function was this production of sex hormones. And in case of men, these were especially testosterone. So the rest of the male reproductive tract is really just a bunch of ducts that carry sperm. And we also have, of course, a number of glands that contribute to the secretions which become semen. And these can be divided in other ways than just ducts and glands. We can also look at division into external and internal parts, but we will proceed structure by structure following the path of sperm. The next structure that we are going to see is epididymis. So once sperm has been produced in the testis, it travels to this structure that is really thin coiled tube packed into this shape, laying on top of the testis. And this is a site where the sperm goes to mature until it's ready to be used. And it takes about 20 days for the sperm, which is initially non-motile when it enters, to pass slowly through the structure and mature into motile, fully functional sperm. And here is also where it gets stored until we are ready to use it. And this can be for several months. So one of my former students said that it helps him to remember the structure to think that even sperm has to go to the school. When an individual ejaculates, the sperm leaves from the epididymis, which contracts, pushing it to this next structure. And this next structure that we are going to look at here is this muscular tube, which is about 45 centimeters long. So that's almost 18 inches, if my math serves me correct. Much longer than we might have initially imagined, right? And this length can be explained by the fact that if we think about it, 
it loops over and then to the posterior side of the urinary bladder. So that adds to the distance to which it has to travel. And this structure has a number of names that you may hear it being referred as. I believe that your textbook uses ductus deferens. And also, especially in Europe, vas deferens is quite a commonly used one. And I see every now and then also ductus deferentia being used too. So knowing that this is a muscular tube, we can work out that its muscular wall, which is in fact a smooth muscle, helps the sperm to travel away from the epididymis and testis towards the opening of the urethra. So transporting sperm can be considered as its main function. And this is where we would perform vasectomy if wanting to perform a sterilization procedure for the men. And this is actually a rather easy operation and does not leave a significant scar or anything. And at times it can be even reversed, but really overall much easier than performing sterilization for a female. And it is nearly 100% effective as a birth control method. Next, we have an interesting structure, which is actually just an enlargement of the vas deferens that we have been looking at just earlier. This structure is known as ampulla, and you can really consider it as simply as a larger version for this part of what we just saw. And then now things are starting to get very interesting as the next part that we can see here is the last time that this tract or duct system is dedicated solely to the reproductive system. After this, the remaining part of the duct is shared with the urinary system and the urinary bladder will empty into it too. But not just yet. So this part is known as ejaculatory duct. And we will actually talk about one clinical pathology that can affect this ejaculatory tract in just a moment. But before that, I want to introduce you to our first gland that we are going to look at. These are on posterior surface of the bladder, and this is going to be seminal vesicle. Its wall contains smooth muscle, which contracts during the ejaculation. It empties into the ejaculatory duct, joining the sperm that has been carried by the vas deferens and then from ampulla. And the secretion from the seminal vesicle is alkaline and contains fructose and prostaglandin. And its pigments can be seen with the UV light. In fact, this secretion forms these seminal glands, makes up about 70% of the semen. If we think about the fructose content of the seminal vesicles secretions, at this point, the sperm has traveled a rather long distance from the epididymis to the ejaculatory duct, and it's likely that at this point it's running low or at least lower on the energy resources that facilitates its swimming movement. So these secretions from the seminal vesicle nourish the sperm at what is, I would say, the roughly halfway point of its journey within the male reproductive tract. So, now with this newfound energy from the secretions from the seminal vesicle, sperm continues its journey along the ejaculatory duct. And we see that there, inferior to the bladder, is another larger gland that contributes to this area. And this walnut-sized gland is going to be the prostate. So not only it contributes to these secretions by secreting what has been described as milky and slightly acidic fluid, which activates the sperm, 
But in addition, what is worthwhile to note is that the ejaculatory tract and the initial part of the urethra emptying the bladder too has to go through it. And what can happen sometimes is that there is excessive growth of prostate. It's not that uncommon. In fact, older you get, the greater of risk of prostate cancer becomes. So age is the major risk factor for this. And this is the second most common cause of cancer deaths in males. But the good news is that 90% of prostate cancers are detected when the cancer is still confined within the prostate. So the prognosis is very good in this case. Some of the early signs and symptoms are related to this part of the ejaculatory duct and the first part of the urethra from the urinary bladder tube that passes through the prostate. When there is excessive growth of prostate, these get squeezed and the patient may have trouble, for example, with urination or passage of seed. How we would treat this is often either by removing the prostate altogether or part of it so that the ducts are open again and the cancerous tissue has been removed. And because this is so common with older men, these days this is a very successful surgery. Now we are going to continue our journey and we see that the remaining of the duct that carries the sperm and all these secretions that have been added to it, it's called from this point onwards as urethra. And we have now semen as there is this mixture of other sections too, rather than just the sperm. And from our chapter of the urinary system, we might remember that there are three regions of male urethra, prosthetic urethra, membranous urethra and spongy urethra. And the last gland that we will look at that adds to these secretions is going to be here and it's called bulbourethral gland or copper's gland. It is secretions are released in response to sexual stimulation and these thick clear mucus secretions they neutralize any traces of acidic urine in the urethra. And as we saw earlier, for the rest of the way throughout the male reproductive system, down this duct named urethra, the semen, which was a mixture of sperm and secretions released by these different glands, travels until exiting at the end of penis. And there is going to be a group of three structures that I will show here just quickly to wrap up this review of male tract. These are erectile tissues called corpus cavernosum and corpus spongiosum. And there are two of the cavernosum and one of the spongiosum. And their function is to help to make the male penis erect so hard so that it can enter the female during the intercourse and deliver the sperm into the female reproductive tract. And that completes our review of the ducts and glands that carry the sperm from the primary sex organ of the male, the testes, into the external world. So, next I want to say a few words about this pouch-like sac that holds the testes. And this is, of course, scrotum. And these are an external part of the male genitalia located inferior to the pelvis, just behind the penis. And of course, this sac is divided into two, each side holding one of the testes. The main purpose for this structure is that it provides a little colder environment for the testes, which needs to be about 3 Celsius degrees cooler temperature than the core body temperature, so that we have the optimal conditions for the sperm production. And the temperature is kept optimal by altering the distance of the scrotum from the body. And this can be achieved by two sets of muscles. These are a dartos muscle, which is smooth muscle that pulls the scrotum close to the body, and in doing so, it also causes the skin of the scrotum to wrinkle. 
and trimester muscle, which are bands of skeletal muscle that elevate the testes. And at this point, I do want to make a mention of the difference between the terms sex and gender as we use them in a biological sense. And while there might be other views and approaches, I am not trying to dispute those, but this is strictly from the view of biology and what we use in a medical context. So, sex is what is coded in your DNA. And with very few exceptions, there are really quite rare. You either have just one or another one. Rarely both or without one. And then gender is more of a socio-cultural content. It is what you relate as. And some may relate as opposite to what their biological sex is, or as neither, or something in between. There is a lot of variation here. But in clinical practice, what we find sometimes is that if someone has transitioned and externally appears as one gender, we still might need to be sure to use the reference ranges for a lot of things from the sex that they are rather than their gender. So just something to keep in mind. And this next section is going to be a little more just for fun, not something that I expect you to know in an exam. But regardless, quite interesting. So I was reading about new research and considering what we are talking about, and this caught my eye. Initially, sperm and mathematics might not appear as to be likeliest combination, but new research from the University of Birmingham brings the two together, hoping to lead to devices that could decrease the infertility rate. So these researchers formulated an equation in algebra describing how efficient a sperm is when it is moving towards the egg. Their hope is that the math can be used to create an app to rate a man's fertility. Why is this important? Well, one in six couples has trouble conceiving and faulty sperm are often the one fact. And identifying a sperm that are ideal for conceiving is actually very hard to do. The principles beyond the current, beyond the current test used actually date from the 1952. So therefore, there is a lot of interest in improving semen analysis. For men with very poor quality sperm, identifying the best individual candidate to inject into woman's egg is, is especially challenging. But it is also so vital to get right because this has a huge impact on the success rate. This is because simply if a sperm cannot get to the egg, it has no chance of fertilizing it. So swimming ability control is critical. And what is interesting, and I guess many of you might not have thought about, is that the sperm doesn't swim in a straight line. They basically have to swing through the mucus, and to do this, they snake through it in an S shape. And this equation above describes how efficiently they do that. At the same time, the Japanese research group have developed a technique to take detailed pictures of sperm on a mobile phone camera adapted with a magnifying lens. Remember, the sperm are very tiny. Their bodies are about five thousandths of a millimeter long. So who knows, maybe these two methods together can lead to a pattern recognition software that processes this data on the phones. And this way help couples with these issues. Future will tell us. Next, I want to talk a little bit about spermatogenesis, which refers to the production of sperm. So spermatozoa, if we use the more medical term. And this takes place at the semiferous tubules of the testes. 
And I am not going to go into detail about the chromosome number of sex cells, so are gametes, as I believe that this would have been covered already in your introductory biology courses. But remember that sperm and egg cell contain only half of the full chromosome number. And this was because when they join, the full number is achieved. So, if you feel at all uncertain about this, please refer to the discussion on mitosis and meiosis on your introductory biomaterials. I will add a link to one summary video on these to the end of this video. But I do want to talk a little about the sperm cell itself, and especially the regions that make up it. And let's start with the headpiece. So this part contains two important structures. First of all, the nucleus, which carries all of the male genetic material that will be passed to the offspring. And here we also have enzymes that help the sperm to penetrate to the egg cell. Then we have midpiece, which is rich with mitochondria. And if you recall, it was the mitochondria that we often described as the cellular powerhouse. So they produce the energy for the sperm cell to carry on its job of moving by swimming ahead using its tail. And as a side note, we do now know that ATP is made also in other parts of the cell than just mitochondria, but these still remain the main site for the energy production. And finally, the tail part. This is the part that actually enables the locomotion of the sperm. So the swimming by these movements of the tail enabled by the phalagellum and the microtubule structure. And just as a side note, the sperm can live in the female reproductive tract up to three days. And the last part that I want to talk about a little bit is going to be the hormonal regulation of the male reproductive system. And this included both the production of both the sperm cell and the sex hormones. And this is regulated by an interaction of three structures, hypothalamus, anterior pituitary gland, and of course also the testes. Together, these are known as hypothalamic pituitary axis, which we have seen before. And then we add to it the testes as well. So that gives us hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis that you see mentioned here. And finally, I want to mention a little bit about the hormones involved in all this. So we have already earlier seen the gonadotropin releasing hormone, which is secreted from the hypothalamus. And it acts as the name suggests on the gonads, so testis. Then we have follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. These are from the anterior pituitary gland. Luteinizing hormone acts at the testes on testosterone production and sperm production. And follicle-stimulating hormone at the testes too on maturation and responding to testosterone as well as on sperm production too. And finally, of course, we do not want to forget the testis role. The interstitial cells here produce testosterone. And one that I have not included in this diagram, but could be considered, is the role of adrenal cortex. And as something to make a mental note about, all of this is regulated, once again, by homeostatic control mechanism loop which we have seen multiple times before. And this is maintained in balance by the negative feedback mechanism of this loop. And here, as the very last thing, 
I want to show how the amount of testosterone produced by the testes reflects the balance among these three interacting sets of hormones that we just saw. The surge before birth reaches the levels of two-thirds of an adult. And then after birth, there is a slight surge that soon levels off remaining low throughout the childhood until puberty. So overall, what we see is that it takes about three years for the levels to balance, after which they are fairly stable. Interestingly, just showing the importance of the interactions of these hormones without gonadotropin releasing hormone and gonadotropins, the testes will atrophy and the sperm and testosterone production will cease. So that completes our review of the male reproductive tract.